Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Winecast. In anticipation of a cast on the Piedmont region of Italy, I decided to take on one of that region's signature grapes, Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo is an interesting grape because while it's not planted widely outside of Italy, or even outside of northern Italy for that matter, its expression in Italy is both famous and remarkable, and it's a grape with a wine culture and style all its own. So without further ado, here's our grape. Like I said a second ago, the majority of this grape's plantings, by a very large margin, are in Italy, with that country being home to around 5,500 hectares, or 92% of the world's Nebbiolo, based on data from 2010. Though Nebbiolo still hasn't cracked the top 50 in terms of most planted varietals, it's on the grow, especially in areas outside of Italy, and even though the size of Italian plantings increased by about 800 hectares between 2000 and 2010, Italy's overall share of the world's plantings dropped by 2%, as an increase in plantings outside of Italy outpaced those inside over the course of that decade. Most hectares under vine for this grape in Italy are located in the north, with a very solid majority of those hectares being in the Piedmont, with almost all of the remaining vines found in either the neighboring regions of Lombardy or the Val d'Aosta. Outside of Italy, you can find small but commercially significant plantings in Australia, in a troika of Latin American countries, Chile, Mexico, and Uruguay, where the grape made its way along with waves of Italian immigration during the 19th century, and increasingly in the United States. The name of this grape, Nebbiolo, is probably derived from the Italian word for fog, nebbia, which is derived in turn from the Latin word nebula, or cloud. Our grape probably came by this moniker thanks either to the autumn fogs and mists that are common in the Piedmont in the fall, when this late ripening grape is finally getting ready for harvest, or thanks to the cloudy bloom that its grape skins are known for, or maybe because of both. You'll occasionally hear someone claim that the name might come from the Italian word nobile, or noble, but without casting aspersions on this grape's origins or quality, that's not very likely. Speaking of origins, research on the genetics of Nebbiolo have established a particularly close relationship between it and another important red grape from northwest Italy, Fresa. Nebbiolo is actually tied pretty closely to a number of northwest Italian grapes, suggesting that it's native to this part of Italy. But the grapes it's most closely linked to have connections of long standing to the Valtellina region in the northern part of Lombardy and it's at least possible that that specific area, and not the Piedmont, may be Nebbiolo's place of origin. As we'll see in a minute, even in a relatively small area like northwest Italy, there are lots of different ways this grape can express, but wherever it's grown, some characteristics remain the same. First, Nebbiolo is a tannic grape, and wines made from it will have lots of astringency that can be moderated to some degree depending on how much time on the skins a winemaker elects to give it. Nebbiolo also tends to produce wines that are markedly light in color with a particular propensity to develop an orange tint as the wine ages. There will be a solid fruit character from the beginning, but it needs time to come into its own and to find its way to the front of the palate as the powerful tannins mellow over time. And eventually, a Nebbiolo will usually show red fruit along with savory and floral aromas and flavors like tobacco, violet, earth, and dried herbs and mushrooms. And, a very famous and beautiful pair of descriptors that you'll hear quite a bit is tar and roses. Because Nebbiolo is by its nature so tannic, the relationship between tannin and fruit is key to understanding and enjoying this grape. In the upcoming cast on the Piedmont, I'll talk about the various winemaking approaches to Nebbiolo that can make it more or less accessible when young, but for now just note that it can take years or even decades for some of the wines made from Nebbiolo, particularly Barolos, to work out an optimal relationship between fruit and tannin. And what are the wines made from these grapes? Well, the most famous are Barolo and Barbaresco, both from the Piedmont and not too far geographically from each other or from the town of Alba in the south-central part of the region. Both Barolo and Barbaresco were made entirely of Nebbiolo, with Barolo usually considered the more powerful and tannic expression, while Barbaresco often gets points for relative lightness as well as elegance and sophistication. The watch where you say that is Barolo has a lot of fans out there who will brook no suggestion that Barbaresco has anything at all on Barolo. There's a lot to say about these two styles, so look for more in the upcoming Piedmont cast. 
Still in the Piedmont, the subregions of Roero and Alba, both very close to the two previous regions, also work with this grape. Roero produces a light-bodied and less tannic expression of this grape and does allow for blending up to 5% of local grapes, including an important local white grape, Arnaise. Nebbiolo d'Alba, by contrast, will tend to be more complex and full-bodied than Roero and, like Barolo and Barbaresco, can only contain Nebbiolo. In the north of the Piedmont, in the sub-regions of Gemme and Gattinara, where Nebbiolo is known locally as Spana, wines driven by this grape will have a light character that emphasizes earthy and savory notes. In Gemme, up to 25% of the wine can be made from grapes other than Nebbiolo Spana, but in Gattinara, no more than 10% of the wine can be made from another grape. And if you leave the Piedmont and head to the Valtellina region in the northern part of Lombardy, that might possibly be where Nebbiolo came into being, you'll find our grape going by the name of Chiavenasca and making wines that can have a somewhat unripe and acidic character because of the difficulty of getting an already late ripening grape like Nebbiolo to mature fully in a very cool subalpine climate zone. To offset this unripe character, the rules for this production zone permit blending in up to 20% local grapes, a number that gets reduced to 10% for the Superiora designation. Because of the markedly cold climate, vintage makes a difference here, and you can score some compelling wines from this region if you're careful to be on the lookout for bottles from warm years. In what was probably another effort to offset the sharpness of the local expression of Nebbiolo, a style called sforzato, that means something like intensified or emphasized, developed in this region and uses dried grapes to make a wine in a similar style to the Amarone of the Veneto. Sforzato is a DOCG, like Valtellina Superiore, and it shares the same requirements for blending as Superiore. These aren't the only appellations in Italy that work with this grape, but they are the biggest and the most widely available and should be a good place to start if you're looking to get to know this grape better. But how about outside of Italy? Well, to be candid, the conventional wisdom is that Nebbiolo doesn't travel well even within Italy, let alone outside of it. But there are more and more parts of the wine world that are making a serious effort to cultivate this grape and to make world-class wines from it. So here are a couple of suggestions. First, even Nebbiolo's biggest fans in Australia will admit that there's room for growth there. But something that bodes well for the land down under is that it's probably home to the most plantings of Nebbiolo outside of Italy, and there are a lot of producers working hard to really make something of our grape there. So it's probably worth the investment to do a little research and check out some of the bottles coming out of Oz. Though plantings and bottlings remain small, Mexico's Baja Peninsula has been getting some positive reviews for its work with Nebbiolo, and if you can find them, those would be some wines well worth checking out and comparing to the grape as it expresses in Italy. Finally, though plantings in the U.S., mostly limited to California and, to a much smaller degree, Washington State, are modest, there's good buzz circulating about some of these wines, and they're worth a look as well. Listen, when all is said and done, there's pretty good consensus that no current expression of this grape matches what you can find in Italy, so your exploration should definitely begin there. But given the effort and energy that wine growers and producers are putting into this grape elsewhere, there's no reason that it should end there as well. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. Though my plate is pretty full at the moment in terms of various obligations I have apart from this cast, I'm still committed to and pretty excited about a dedicated Piedmont cast, so look for that in the very near future. Thanks as always for watching and especially for liking, subscribing, and commenting, and for otherwise being a supporter and friend of this channel. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.